In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the various two-dimensional shapes that 3ds Max provides in its modeling toolset. Going in, know that accurately drawing flat 2D shapes will be essential in creating realistic 3D objects for your scenes. Now, before we begin exploring our 2D tools, it's important that we get off to a good start by beginning to use the actual terminology or lingo that Max uses in order to differentiate between things that are three-dimensional and things that are two-dimensional. You see, up until now, I've been frankly a little loose as to the words I've been using to describe what we've been creating, using the terms objects and shapes to mean pretty much the same thing. And you'd normally think that the two words would be interchangeable. In 3ds Max, though, they're not. Max officially reserves the word shape to describe something that's two-dimensional. Using the word object, the software is officially referring to something three-dimensional. So from here on out, I'll try my best to keep the two terms straight. Specifically using the word shape to describe something that's 2D, and using the term object when specifically referring to something created in Max that's 3D. Now, another difference between objects and shapes is where they're specifically found when snooping around under the Command Panel's Create tab. Objects are found by accessing the Geometry icon over in the right-hand column, whereas shapes have their own home, under the Shapes button. Let's click on the Shapes icon and see what's available. Now, we're going to temporarily skip the line command, being that creating lines will be discussed as a separate topic in detail in an upcoming video in this chapter. So, let's start with the rectangle command. Working in my front view, a rectangle feels like drawing a box, but without the dimension of height. Once the command's been activated, I'll draw my rectangle starting in the upper left-hand area, drawing diagonally down to the right-hand side. Once you're happy with the shape, let go of the left mouse heading to the Modify column. OK, let's see what we have for settings. We can change the rectangle's length, its width, and an option called Corner Radius, which will kind of round out all four corners. Try that. With each control, I'll simply right-click before letting go of the left mouse to cancel out of the command. OK, let's go ahead and delete our rectangle, head back to the Create column, and we'll create a circle. Starting at the crosshairs in our viewport, let's simply drag diagonally out to the outside. With a circle, the only setting you have in the Modify section will be the radius. Go ahead and change that, then again right-click before committing to the change. Let's delete that, and we'll draw an ellipse. Now the ellipse will feel like drawing a reshapable circle. Let's draw that from the upper left again to the lower right-hand corner. Moving your mouse up and down and left to right will control the ellipse's shape until you let go of the left mouse button. For its controls, we can adjust both its length and its width. Removing that from within the view, let's create an arc. Now the Arc command has a couple of different options under the Creation method. You can draw the arc using either the End in Middle option or the option named Center and End. Let's try both. We'll start with the default setting of End in Middle. Position your mouse in the middle of the screen, click, hold down, then drag directly to the right. Once your mouse is in position on the right-hand side, let go, then push your mouse either up or down. So using this option, we first determine both ends, then control the middle. I'll right-click to cancel out. Now with the Center End In option, things work a little bit different. Let's first of all on the right-hand side make the changeover. Back in the screen, we'll then again click in the middle, then drag directly to the right-hand side. This time, when letting go of the left mouse button, we'll draw in a circular fashion. Let's go ahead and set that. We'll go back to the middle of our screen, then draw a smaller arc inside the one we've previously created. So the Center In In option works well when wanting to draw concentric rings. Let's go to the Modify column and see what our controls look like. We can change the overall radius of our arc. 
we can adjust both where the arc starts and where it ends. And we have an option that'll connect our line together in the middle by using Pi Slice. So there you go with the arc command. Let's go ahead and window select all three of our shapes and hit delete. Now, the next shape option is called Donut, which basically is a circle inside another circle. Let's draw that. Beginning in the middle of the screen, let's draw diagonally, then let go of our mouse. That'll set the first inside circle. Continuing to draw diagonally, let's push farther out to the side, then click with the left mouse button. OK, with both circles on the screen, let's head to the Modify column and take a look at our settings. You've got controls for both the inside radius, that'd be radius number 1, and the outside radius being radius number 2. With the donut, the inside circle is considered to be what is referred to as nested. We'll talk more in detail about the nesting process coming up in just a moment. Let's go ahead and delete that, heading back to the crate column. Next up, located in the panel below arc, let's create an N-GON. Now, probably a new term for you, GON is simply a fancy way of saying side, with the letter N being used to determine the actual number of sides your shape will contain. Clicking on the N-GON button, let's draw one starting in the middle of our screen. You'll again simply click, then drag diagonally to determine the overall size. Once in place, let's head over to the Modify column. In addition to the N-GON's radius, you can also determine the number of sides. In addition to that, you also have a control called Corner Radius. This will round out the corners, smoothing them out. Also notice there's an option called Circular. With the Circular option, you can create a round object consisting of a certain number of vertices that number being determined by the number of sides that you add to your N-GON. So for an example, with Circular On, I've now created a circle-type shape, in this case consisting of six vertices. Remember, that number being determined by the number of sides on my N-GON. I'll go ahead and turn the Circular option back off. OK, let's go ahead and remove the N-GON from play. We'll go back to our Create column, this time creating a star. Now with the star, we'll again start in the middle of the screen, then drag diagonally out to the outside. Once you're happy with the overall size, let go of your mouse, then pull back in. Click one last time to set the star, then let's head over to the Modify column. Adjusting the Radius 1 value will determine the extended length on the star shape. Radius 2 controls just how thick or thin the body of the star is on the inside. Points simply determines the number of extensions or arms on the star. You can take things down to as few as 3, or as many as 100. I'll again right-click to set that back to the default. The distortion setting will take the inside of the star spinning at either clockwise or counterclockwise. You also have corner rounding adjustments being labeled as Fillet Radius 1 and Fillet Radius 2. Radius 1 will round out the corners on the outside of the star shape, while Radius 2 will work on the inside corners. Creating text in Max is also done at the 2D shape level. Let's delete our star, heading back to the Crate column. Heading toward the middle of the screen, let's go ahead and click, then we'll go in for our adjustments. You'll notice that by default, the lettering starts with the standard name Max Text. Let's change that in the Modify column. Down at the bottom of our currently visible settings, under Text, let's highlight that, changing it to instead 3ds Max. Things will update automatically on the screen. Above the Text field, you have a handful of different controls, one being Size to change the overall size of your lettering. You can also quickly and easily change your font style. Let's click where it reads Arial. Now, the actual fonts that you'll find in your list will be determined by just exactly what has and hasn't been loaded onto your personal computer. From my list, I'm going to go ahead and choose Bimini Italic. If you happen not to have that specific font, you can choose something that you like, even though it may differ from my current selection. 
By the way, as a side note, another easy way to be able to shift through your font list is to use the up and down arrows on your keyboard. Below the size setting, you'll find a control called kerning, which can be used to spread the letters going left to right. Let's try that. Now, to show you how letting works, we'll need a second line of text. Back in the text field, we'll click behind the X in our name, then hit Enter. Now being able to add a second line of text, I'll type in rocks followed by an exclamation point. With that in place, adjusting the letting will spread the words going up and down. And you've also got some standard text editing commands like you'd find in a word processing program. We can change the lettering to italicized, we can underline it, and we can also determine its justification. Being centered, matching up on the right hand side, evening things out on their width left to right, or taking things back to being justified on the left hand side. Let's go ahead and delete that, then take our viewports back to four ways using Alt W for the next command. Now, the helix, though considered to be a shape, is drawn to look more three dimensional. Let's create it in our top view. Starting from the middle and dragging outward, it'll feel originally like a circle. And when you're happy with the size, let go, focus your attention in the front view, and push up. When you're happy with the height, click one more time, drag backwards, and click again. OK, so that's the original shape. Let's go to the Modify column and we'll see what adjustments we can make. First, let's go ahead and hit shift Control z so we can center our work. As for the controls, let's begin by changing the number of turns. Radius 1 will control the bottom of the helix, while Radius 2 will control the top. You also have an adjustment for height which will control the overall distance from top to bottom. With the bias, you can adjust the coiling part either to be more toward the top or more toward the bottom. Creating the effect of anything from a snake coiled up for the attack, to maybe a spool of yarn hanging from the ceiling dropping down. There's also a control to determine whether the helix turns clockwise or counterclockwise. Let's go ahead and delete that and we'll create a brand new shape available in Max 2013 named Egg. I'll draw that in the front view. Now, the egg shape is basically just that, giving you the opportunity to be able to create an egg-like shape. Once you've set the inside line, you can double up that line if needed by simply continuing to drag to the outside. In the settings, you've got controls for both the length, the width, and the ability to eliminate that outline egg shape. With the outline on, you can also control the threshold which determines the distance between the two egg-shaped lines. The angle is merely used to control or rotate the shape around clockwise or counterclockwise. So there you go with your 2D shape options, each command no doubt serving a very important purpose in the overall 3ds Max modeling process. Practice up and take the time to get to know each command well. Now, in the next video, we're going to be looking at creating what are called nested shapes. In essence, building one shape inside another. Let's go take a look at that.